Hey guys, welcome to an episode of In Range. I've got a very special Q&A here for you. I'm actually at Woodland Brutality at the Echo Valley Training Center in West Virginia, but we've got Annette Evans, who you've seen on the channel from On Her Own, and you're out here in person finally. Yeah, I finally made it out. I'm really excited. It was a great opportunity to drive just a couple hours to hang out in person, yeah. see what you're doing here, and talk about some really cool stuff. So we're going to do a bunch of videos. We're going to start with a Q&A, but we've got like a whole smorgasbord of things here to talk about. We sure do. I am really excited about all the topics we're going to be talking mm -hmm. about here, and some of them are actually... We're going to talk about the Q&A questions, and some of them I'm going to have to tell you, you're going to have to watch another video because we're already planning on talking about them. Yeah, and that's fine. That happens all the time. Like, and it's going to be perfect. And it's good to reference other videos and get more deeper dives on things. So these are, we always have lots of questions, so I'm just going to get started. Sure. Yeah. So this one's from Daniel C. And the first question is, and I think it's the most appropriate one, is how did On Her Own start your, your project? So I have been involved in guns, firearms, self-defense for well over a decade now. And I'd always be kind of interested in what does it take to defend yourself? What does it take to be safe? And then I got divorced and I was out there in the world by myself. I'm sitting in a class and I'm going to reference Tatiana Whitlock now and she knows this. I'm sitting in her class. We're talking about women's concealed carry, something like that. She asked, well, why do we do this? Why do we put so much work into carrying a gun, into learning how to shoot, how to defend ourselves? And she asked everybody to look at their phone and look at what the picture on their lock screen. And for most of the people in the class, it was like their kids, their family, something like that. And mine's like my dead cat. <laughs> my dead, dearly departed, loved cat. And I'm like, I have nobody. How do I do this when I don't, when I'm not a mom, when I, I'm, you know, I'm not a daughter, I'm not a partner, I'm not a wife, I'm not a girlfriend, I'm not a sister. How do I be safe on my own? So I've started thinking about the self-defense aspects of I can't rely on somebody who's going to be next to me who's carrying a gun. And I started thinking about, like, what is my motivation to shoot a bad guy when it's not, he's coming after my kids? Mm -hmm. And then on her own grew from that because I realized while I'm living in my crappy little divorce apartment, well, what does it take to, you know, get my finances in order? How do I feed myself? How do I work out? So this is how On Her Own started was all these questions about how do I, as a single woman who's all alone in the world, who doesn't have all the traditional support structures, survive? And is surviving enough? And I'm going to argue it's not. No, so, you, it's really about trying to thrive, right? Right. right? Survival is one thing, thriving is another. So that's what On Her Own is about. That's where it came from is me realizing like there's really nothing in the self-defense industry and really in the world that talked about the whole spectrum of what does it take to survive and to thrive. Yeah, you know, we never really talked about that in particular in the way we, you said it just now in that uh, like On Her Own is one way to look at that is just On Her Home from a self-defense perspective. But frequently, I mean, in all of us, not just yourself, we think about this topic, but really the topic isn't about self-defense because it is, but self-defense is only one element of being a healthy, happy human being. And this is so, the self-defense part is so you can continue to be a ha happy, healthy human being, either yourself or those you care about. Right. But this is only one element of ha happy and healthy. We talk about this uh, on, with other people I've done Q&As in collaboration with, and so many times we also neglect things like, for example, what you're touching on, something I've experienced too, which is community uh -huh. and people around us. And those are the, when it really comes down to it, that's really all you ever really got, is you and the, the bonds that you do make. The family of, the family of your heart, your family of choice. Mm -hmm. and, and frequently for a lot of us, some of us, that's, that's all we got. We have to make it. You have to build it. You aren't just born into it. Nope. Not everyone just has that naturally come to them. Sometimes we have to build that ourselves. And if we're really lucky, we have both. But right, right, right. I'm not, there. That's not to denigrate those that have yeah. that. Good. Some of us are super lucky. We manage both. Yes. Some of us, you know, we only have one or the other. And how do we make that the best that it can be for us? I love that. And that is on her own. That makes sense because that, that, that adds so much more scope to, that, to those words, right? That's what I'm trying. I love that, honestly. All right, Jordan W., Hey, happy to have Annette returning. People love those series, so I'm glad that you're here. Um, my question, how important is it for a woman to have a weapon when fending off a determined male attacker? Asking from the perspective of someone in a regulatory environment, prohibiting anything even identifiable as a weapon. That's a hard question, right? Um, the reason we have weapons is because on average, in general, 
women are going to be smaller, weaker, mm. you know, less physically advantaged. You know, when you look at disparity of force problems, it's very common that it's almost automatic that a man attacking a woman, the woman has disparity of force and can use more to respond to it. So you know, how important are they? Well, to overcome those physical disadvantages, you either need tools or you need skill or you need both. Yeah. However, you can survive without them. The willingness to fight, the determination to survive and to triumph really, really are the keys. I could take an extremely well-trained fighter, somebody who, you know, is carrying a gun, knows how to use it, is like a USPSA grandmaster, but if they aren't willing to fight, there's nothing I can really do for them. So, you know, is a tool necessary? In some cases, it's gonna be, a, it may make the difference. I won't say that it won't, but it's not going to be, if you don't have a weapon, that doesn't mean you're automatically dead. There's a lot else that you can do both in terms of, and I hate the word mindset, right? Like, ah, people talk about, you get a mindset know. your way yeah. out of this. And I'm These like, buzzwords, but, but like, sometimes they do apply. But there is something to that, right? Yeah. Are you willing to fight? Are you willing to do? And then there's skill, right? Even without weapons or even without real weapons, skill will get you beyond some of that. Mm -hmm. You know, Carl, if we went to the mats right now mm -hmm. and got, got a little ground fighting in, who's going to win? You will win. And it's not just like, a, oh, I'm going to brag here. Like, well, I'm a... Uh, I'm sure I'm a certain of that. I, I'm a jiu-jitsu purple belt right now. Mm -hmm. And you're I'm not. just not that much bigger than me in that kind of world. Mm -mm. And I was saying that everybody needs to go train for years and years and years in hand-to-hand -hand combat. No. But I think you can probably put together a skill level that will give you a higher chance of surviving and winning fun. Yep. And I know that immediately going to that question is not a loaded question. I know that answer because you put it the work in, right? And that's where the thing is, is that's an interesting comment because tools without skill can occasionally with luck be the advantage, but skill will be something you always have. Yep. And skill, tools with skill is a force multiplier. Tools without skill can also become a liability. Absolutely. So that's the interesting challenge there. And skill isn't always combative skill can be social know-how street cred how to communicate how to human those things all matter too knowing where to hide you know, yeah. sometimes in the self-defense community we make fun of run hide fight because we're like well we should have to, we should mm -hmm. fight first of all run hide fight is not in order second uh running and hiding can in fact be really really good strategies mm -hmm. and they require a certain amount of physicality and they cer a certain amount of knowledge and if you're so focused on why can't I fight, uh, why don't you spend a little of that focus on thinking about well, how can I run and where can I run and where can I hide that will actually make a real difference. Yep. And my other example of that is when you just run into someone in the street that's having a bad day or on a bad trip and being able to communicate with someone and de-escalate something just from being kind can also, I'm not talking about no. all circumstances apply, right. right? But just being kind can sometimes also diffuse the problem. And that's something we forget about. Like, Absolutely. So, and that's a skill. That's a skill too. Uh, Chris G, in my experience, more sheltered slash suburbanite women, he's, this person says, but I'm going to say people because this is across the board. And I'm going to use the word privilege because if you have the privilege of never having to deal with an attack, you have privilege. Um, seem to approach the topic of self-defense with reservation or discomfort. What barriers, concerns, or stigmas should the community be more active in dispelling to encourage a more welcoming approach to a broader range of people? First of all, true crime is a genre that people are really into. Yeah. So connecting with people about the things that they're worried about and not making fun of them mm -hmm. is part of it. Like human trafficking. We've all mm -hmm. seen the social media. I stopped this guy from traffic who was following me around the grocery store and he was totally human trafficker and I threw him off the scent by doing blah, 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 blah. Yep, yep. It is silly. It's incredibly uncommon. That's not how tr human trafficking works pretty much across the board. Mm -hmm. But hey, you know what? Maybe we can address that fear and make it a little more productive and talk about. I actually just had a post about this a couple days ago. Hey, that guy's following you around the grocery store. Here are some really practical things you can do to make yourself safer. Instead of going, 
you're stupid for thinking you might be human trafficked. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you are. Maybe you are. Maybe you're one of that small number. That's possibly that's what that was. But I can give you strategies that speak to that safety. So sometimes we have to meet people where they are, meet them with the things that they're afraid of. And sometimes it's, you know, we can't reach people. And we have to reach people with the things that they're comfortable with. So maybe they're not comfortable with the idea that some bad guy is going to break into my house and try to kill everybody in my house in their sleep. Also a rare occurrence, but it does happen. I mean, they don't want to think about that. Instead yeah. of trying to scare them into that, maybe we can think about what's more likely is there's a, there's a panhandler who really bothers me when I go into the city for lunch. Okay, let's deal with that. Keeping people safe from small things is just as important as keeping people safe from the big things that we want to scare them with. Sure. So it's kind of both ends of the spectrum. And sometimes they're scared of things you're like, well, that's kind of dumb to be afraid of. Like, no, yeah. but we can still work with that. And it's a wedge, right? If they mm -hmm. start thinking about that, we can start thinking about the small things. Sometimes they don't want to think about the big things that could happen that we're worried about. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Where are the small things? And if they worry about the small things, and we can get... You know, that, that person who's like, I don't really like that super aggressive panhandler. What can I do? And we get them to start carrying pepper spray. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe in a couple of months, couple of years, they start thinking about other things and we can start going, hey, have you ever thought about carrying a gun? Let's talk about what that's like. And then there's the whole, especially with guns, um, guns don't have to be for self-defense. No, they could be fun. They Skill be building. Fun. They could be community building. That's what we're doing here. We got a whole bunch of people yeah. here that are friends because they're shooting a match together. So right. Yeah. So you know, we could we could take people to the range and teach them how to shoot, and it has nothing to do with self defense, and that comes later down the road. Oh no! Oh my! Enjoying something like this? Yeah, exactly. We're just gonna go. We're gonna talk about one of the funnest guns I've ever shot mm. later on today. I know. Yeah. And I'm so looking forward to seeing your face <laughs> when you shoot this gun for the first time. And it's time. kind of unique, interesting too. Honestly, it'll be fun. Uh, and and I would love to take somebody who's like, yeah, I don't know about this gun, self-defense. And be like, just come with me to the range and shoot this. I'm going to teach you a life skill of shooting a gun. You never have to do it again. Yep. Just come have fun. And nothing else, you're going to have a good time knocking some steel plates over or something. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, Judo Joker. What are some typical mistakes or bad decisions people make when trying to encourage or be inclusive while entering a traditionally male-dominated community? Like, so what are some examples of, like, the way to do it right to be like there's the one thing you can go out and be like we're an inclusive space you can say that all day long what's the way to do that right well i, I would like to start by saying that yeah I, I think that sometimes people don't say hey you're welcome that's fair that's fair just that that's a good first step right right I'm not, i guess i shouldn't mean that that's wrong but like what's another way to make that actually realized where it's like it's not just words it's palpable uh, some of it is having gear, equipment, facilities that are geared towards them, welcoming towards them. So one thing I think about, and this is a crusade I've been on for over 10 years now, is if you want more women going to the range, let's have good bathroom facilities for them. That is such a real thing. <laughs> it's true. It's one of those things, like, I'm not supposed to talk about it because we're talking about bodily functions. But I'm like, no, can we true. have, like... Real bathrooms, flush toilets, a, a clean porta potty, maybe that, a handicap size one. That's at least a step forward, right? Not some gross thing. Because here's the thing going out to the range, shooting a match, it can be really scary. It's really hard. You're going into a world where you're like, I already feel like I don't belong. It might be remote and distant too, which is a little bit weird. You know, I'm creepy. driving up like yeah. this like single track dirt road mm -hmm. to get here. It's mm -hmm. already intimidating if this isn't your world. And then the capper is go pee in the woods. Or this thing that hasn't been cleaned in a week. It's really bad when I go to a range and the guys are like, that outhouse is really gross. Yeah. And like, you don't have to sit. <laughs> right. No. Right. Totally. Yeah, it's absolutely. So if you want to be inclusive, have facilities that are welcoming and inclusive. Yeah. One of the best ranges I've ever been on is a Mead Hall in Oklahoma. Okay. Dude, they've got air conditioning in the bathrooms. Wow. All right, yeah, that's pretty That's pretty luxurious. So, like, being able to be like, I, this class is overwhelming. I, I don't like thinking about this whole, these horrible things that could happen to me. I'm going to go take a little break. I'm going to take a little walk into this clean, air-conditioned bathroom with modern plumbing. Hey, you want to talk about being welcoming and inclusive? Having that space is welcoming. It's such a simple thought, but it's not, like, yeah, it's something that's... This isn't about being a range princess, which I totally am. <laughs> 
it's about how do we treat people like human beings? Yeah, yeah. Right. It's the same thing. Like, if you're taking people to the range and all you've got are, you know, about my forty-five. Yeah. And you've got a new shooter. Do you think that's going to be something that's welcoming to them that they're going to enjoy for the first rounds that they ever fire in their life? No, the first round's trauma. Quite honestly, they're like, right. can we put it down and go now? Like yeah. this isn't fun. There's mm-hmm. there's some small portion. Somebody's going to put in the comments. Well, I shot a forty five for my first gun and I loved yeah, it. Okay, great. It, that's the anomaly. That's cool. Yeah. I'm super happy for you. I will tell you that is not common. Right. Of course not. And then, you know, we're thinking about concealed carry 101, and we all tell people, every instructor, you need to bring your gun, a safe holster, a belt, or these days an enigma, I have to have the right gear. Somebody inevitably shows up with something that's not right. Yeah, they got an Uncle Mike or something because that's what they had. Or maybe that's all they got the money for. Like, that's right. possible, Or they don't too. know any better. Right. They, thought yeah. that they, they thought that it fit the requirements. So, you know, it's not just a matter of do we have a gun that works for a holster works for them. Do we have a belt that's in their size? Probably not. Because right. you know how many times I've shown up and the loner belts are like dude sized? Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. And that's I'm a... thinking about it from the point of view from women, but. Yeah, that's a simple point. And, you know, here's another one that's not equipment related or gear or facilities related. It's like, how are we treating people? And I'm not saying. So I come from a little different of a world sometimes. I'm like, I'm not saying we have to be super nice and super friendly and super kind to everybody all the time. We need to start there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you're in the kind of environment where, like, oh, we're making fun of everyone here, yeah. include them. Don't go over the line with them if they're like, yeah, I'm not comfortable being teased about X. Like, listen to that. Mm-hmm. But if that's the way your group of friends shows love, include them in that. Otherwise, they're an outsider. Then they're the outsider, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of the classes I take, we are equal opportunity. Everyone gets <laughs> made fun of for something. And I would encourage, when you're new and you're the outsider coming in, be open to that being a love language. You know, it's funny you say that because we have that at our brutality events. We always encourage friendly, fun uh, razzing from the crowd. And so people are there like cheering someone on, but it's also it's like, you do better if you stopped missing, right? Like that, it doesn't matter. It's just fun. That was yeah. good for a girl. <laughs> So, you know, I've heard that. And yeah. on one hand, that could be really insulting. Yeah. On the other hand, that could be the love language of the it people. It depends on the would. delivery and the person the and knowing. The delivery, the person, how you're responding, how they read your response. So I'm just saying on both ends, be open to including people in that and being willing to go, hey, I understand that you're trying to be funny and nice, but not cool. That didn't work. That didn't sure. work. Right, yeah. Respecting that, but also being like, hey, I get that. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm one of them now. They called me just a girl. <laughs> That's right, though, but that's inclusion in a different way, right? Leaving if, if everyone's got their click and then you're just not in it, you're on the outside. No. Yep. Right? Yep. Fair. Fair, fair, fair. Ah, someone that's watched your content. Damien A., I really appreciated your review of the flashbang holster, which I initially wrote off, which I can understand why. I mean, I would, too. Most typical concealment positions require a belt and looser clothing around the hips. What challenges are most difficult for concealing a weapon and not looking out of place I'm, I'm going to say as a woman, I'm going to say as a small frame or a smaller frame person. Um, which typically female-oriented concealment solutions are useful and do you have one that's particularly not? Uh, so I'm a huge fan of the Enigma, as you might be able to tell with what's on the table here. And part of that is, you know, my very good friends, John and Sarah Hopman and Jill Considine, were involved in inventing it. Mm-hmm. And I was part of the genesis because I kept complaining to John, like, why can't I carry a gun when I don't want to wear real pants? <laughs> Oh, yeah. no, I don't like wearing real pants. I want to carry a gun. So I think the Enigma is probably one of the best overall. It's the 80 to 90 percent solution to carrying a gun for me, no matter what I'm wearing. I have carried an Enigma in a bridesmaid's dress. That's impressive. So it, it can be done. I think that there's a big mistake made around dressing around the gun. And part of it is, on one end, you have people go, you have to dress around the gun, and they're willing to put tents on yeah, and that's true. use that to hide the gun. It's true. And, like, that's not quite it because that's not what people want to wear, and that's okay. We don't need to tell people you need to change everything about your style in order to carry a gun. On the other hand, you get the people who go, I don't want to change anything at all about how I dress in order to carry a gun. Like, honey, you like wearing skin-tight crop tops and bodycon dresses. There is no space 
between your skin and your clothing. Mm. I can't put anything where there's no space. There's no like magic pocket dimension mm. that I can put on your body and hide even the smallest gun, the smallest weapon. There has to be some amount of space. So you're going to have to make some adjustments in how you dress. Yeah, of course. So I think that's the biggest mistake is the people who go, you have to dress around the gun and totally change everything that you wear. And well, I don't want to dress around my gun at all. I'm like, mm. Strange. It's almost like polarized extremes are never usually the answer. I wonder how that works. Yeah. Interesting. Same thing here. Oh, oh. Yeah. So you got to be a little give and take. Doesn't have to be a tent, but you maybe don't wear your um, your skin tight gym, gym shorts to the uh, conceal a pistol. Or at least you don't wear your gym, skin tight gym shorts and go, why can't I carry my <laughs> can't giant I? WML? With my light and laser and red dot sight. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> get out. There might be a reason for that. We'll talk about that some more, too. I think this is a really good one. Dominic, how do you avoid, and I think this is, you always hear about trying to instill vigilance, but there's a reality to this. How do you avoid hypervigilance? Because it's possible to get to the point where it's just paranoia, right? Oh, ah, condition red, constantly. There's, there's, there's someone behind that tire right now, right? I mean, that stuff, you see that a lot, and... I think that that causes burnout. If you get to the point where it's just constant hypervigilance, you have to be, you have to, do, every time you walk outside, you're going to be attacked. You can't live. It's like, that's a terrible life. So that's a good question, I think, is how to avoid hypervigilance. So um, my first answer is going to be get some therapy. And I'm, I'm, I'm not actually, I'm saying that lightly, but I'm not saying that lightly. Because one mm. of the reasons hypervigilance happens is a really good one, is we've had reason to need to be hypervigilant. The problem is a lot of times that comes from trauma and mm -hmm. you can tell yourself all you want. Well, I'm not going to be, I'm going to relax. And your body and your brain just aren't going to without, without a little bit of help. There's a line in the room and if it isn't one, you're going to find it, right? That kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, you might need therapy and look, I think everybody needs therapy. So, but that is a, that's an area. We see this a lot with abuse victims, with people coming back from combat zones, with people mm -hmm. who have lived in very violent areas. Hypervigilance is a survival mechanism. It is not necessarily a bad thing in certain environments. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you bring it back to that safe place that you're otherwise in. And, you know, it changes the way your brain operates. It changes the way your body responds. And you mm -hmm. might need professional help to fix that. And living on a constant source of cortisol is not healthy either. No. It's, a, it's really what I'm hearing is it's, I mean, it's, these, re, these things develop for reasons. Yep. And it can be, it, it, there are circumstances where it is your only, the reason you're here today is because you were that. Yep. But it can at some point become a maladaptive evolution or education. And now when that isn't the situation you're in, your brain's going to tell you that it's there. So, you know, step one is consider strongly if you need therapy. Yeah. Now, the other part of it is, you know, for like sort of more common, like how do you like stop being the person who has to sit with their back to the wall and know where all the exits are in the restaurant yeah, and all yeah. that. Um, you know how you got there? Do you remember all of the things you did to get there and reminding yourself all the time that I have to be able to see everybody coming in and I have to know where the exits are and I have to know all the escape routes? There's a reason you got there. But you did work to get there, right? Fair. You, you probably like, I went to a class or I watched a video and this is what I said. Or I, I survived do. certain things yeah. even, right? Yeah. And it became a thing and I consciously started doing that. Well, what you consciously decided to do, now you can consciously decide to do the other thing. Mm -hmm. You know what? Like I, when I go out to dinner with most of my friends, most of my friends are kind of like about that life. Mm -hmm. We really don't care who sits with their back to the window or the door or whatever else because we're all capable. Right, yeah. We, we, we might choose on who's local because nobody wants to, like, have to travel again to go to court. Sure. Or, right. you know? <laughs> uh, but, like, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? If I'm sitting across the table from, you know, most of the people I train with, it doesn't matter. They think about the exits. So I'm like, I can get to a point where I can consciously think to myself, hey, I'm not going to worry about that today. I already know where, like, the two are like I know where the back door is I know where the front door is I don't need to know how to get out through the kitchen yeah there's a big difference between being flippant about it and being co like constantly in paranoia right these are yep. two different things and you can constantly you can consciously decide hey I'm home right now it's cool guns in the safe I'm gonna have a drink 
You know, also, there's a certain amount of just for me, at least, this is my take on it. There's a certain amount of acceptance of the reality of that life is not an infinite thing. Yep. It, it is a finite thing. And living the best one you can sometimes indicates letting your guard down. Yeah. And sometimes that turns you into Wild Bill Hickok. Sitting at the table being taken out by one eye Jack McCall because you didn't sit with your back to the to the wall. However, living like that isn't living. And that's the problem too. And, and there's one other thing you can do is if you are at a skill level where you can come back from that deficit. That's true. You become a lot more comfortable with sitting in that deficit on on purpose. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, like if I decide that I'm gonna go to a concert and I know there's metal detectors and blah blah blah. I could go through the entire exercise of like, how do I sneak my gun past and do this and that, which may be worthwhile and may be the right thing Depends to do. Depends on the circumstance, you know, what right? is, what's going on here, yeah. Or you may decide, you know what, it's a really good show, it is my favorite band, they never come here, I don't, there's nowhere for me to safely lock up my gun if they catch me, it, you know, I'm going to be late to the show, all these other things, YOLO. Yeah. Just go. Just go. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I personally would rather die having enjoyed that show than sitting at home having a heart attack because I've been so stressed out and that I couldn't even go. And lamenting the fact that you're not there with your friends or seeing something you wanted to enjoy. Yep. I, I, I agree. E. Rahia, do you think, and we talked about this on, you well, you talked about this on, on, on her own at some point. Do you think rape alarms are useful devices? Hey, when's the last time you heard a car alarm? Uh, today. What'd you do about it? Nothing. Yeah. It just isn't a thing. Is there an off chance it could startle your attacker and all? I guess. But, uh... Well, it's like the episode you did for, for us on InRange with, um, with the, uh, stun gun. I mean, could it in some circumstance make someone do pain compliance? Maybe? But you were just thrusting that thing into the guy, and it didn't even make him twitch, right? And so this thing making a bunch of noise, is it a chance? They'll go, oh, and then walk off. Yeah, and sometimes the bear runs away from a whistle. But what? I could have a rape alarm in my hand, or I could have pepper spray in my hand. I only Far have better hands. device, yeah. I, I know which one I'm going to pick. And that's a great lead into the next question. Uh, Tyler A., I bought some quality pepper spray recently and bought an inert unit to try it out. How often do you actually recommend practicing with an inert or water unit? And is there really a better way or is there a need to practice with pepper spray? I think the inert water units are the best way to practice with them. If mm -hmm. you have one that matches your pepper spray, um, even after it runs out of the inert, it's still useful for how do I access it? How do I position it in my hand? How do I defeat the safety? Like the draw and present draw like you would with a present, pistol. Yeah. Right? Okay. You don't need the water in it in order to do that. Um, how often? Some of that's going to depend on you. In the beginning, I would say it's probably more important than I've been carrying pepper spray and practicing it with it for several years. Mm -hmm. um, I like to put it into my force on force scenarios. Like mm -hmm. That's another force option I carry when I do force on Especially force. Especially a water one because you're actually deploying a fluid, right? Yep. Or, or something, yeah. So like when I've done ECQC with Craig, I had pepper spray on me, mm -hmm. things like that. So how often, it's going to depend on you and your skill level, your experience. I would say it's not just a matter of like pulling it out and spraying it and make sure it hits the things that you want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you also want to think about are you able to use it inside of scenario, inside of... Yep. And know, that's the presentation. Situation. Can you get to it? I think it's interesting to deploy it once to see how does this thing even spray? Because mm -hmm. you don't want to be surprised the first time. What does it, like, does it miss? Does it spray? How far does it spray? Like, how that's, do you aim? That's all good. Like, aiming is a thing with pepper spray and it's not necessarily uh, instinctive. No, you just kind of just... I'm kidding. I'm joking. It was a joke. <laughs> it's a shotgun. You just point it. No, but well, at the same time, some of the time, can be more like that. Less no, no, I understand. But I, yeah, I, yeah. I know you, the look yeah, you gave yeah. me was amazing. No, no, no. I'm kidding. Yeah. But like the point is, but your point of presentation, can mm -hmm. you get it out of the pocket or off your belt? Once you've, once you understand how this one deploys in terms of what it does, now you can worry about getting to it. Yep. I think that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Yeah. But I think you want to do that once. If you buy a unit and you just don't have any idea what really happens when you push the button, you probably you kind of got to play you, with that. I mean, you have an idea, but you, you, you might want to know more. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it really is kind of the best way. I like to put it inside mock scenarios. But... Mm-hmm. Sure. Jeff Trapper, MD. Not an actual doctor. Um, welcome back, they say. And, and I feel the same. Um, big fan of your work, and I pass 
on, on her own to all my friends looking for practical info on self-defense options. As a fellow Beretta fan, oh, we know where this is going, now that you're a month past since you got it, how is that 80X Cheetah treating you? I'm carrying it every time I carry a gun. You love it, huh? I love it. This this is the gun that I wanted to carry. I, I was fortunate to shoot one of the prototypes of it, and I have been bothering Beretta ever since to <laughs> let it hit the market and get my hands on one. Yep. Uh, I'm told I had one of the first that made it out in the awesome. U.S. That's nice. And um, it, it's mine now. Mm. It's, it's mine now. Yeah. Uh, it, it is, for me, the perfect concealed carry gun. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what you think of it. We're going to have a whole video on that pistol, so yes, we're going to get more into that. I think the subtitle in my, in my uh, notes for it is, Why Annette Loves This Gun. That's super cool. <laughs> I, I'm really excited. I've been wanting to, to do that, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, da Fuchs, which is probably pronounced differently. Uh, what is the worst self-defense advice for women you've ever come across that sounded good but was com was doesn't work? So not something that's obviously stupid, like something that like oh, and then oh no. Be more situationally aware. Mm. Sounds awesome, and we should in fact be aware of what our environment is. But like, what does situationally aware mean? It's as I think Craig and a lot of other instructors I've set, I've had said, situationally aware is not a verb. You can't like situationally aware a thing. Like, well, what does that mean? And then I, I have situationally aware. I know what's going on. I hear the birds. I hear the gunfire. What do I do about it? Right. Okay. So I see a guy running at me with a machete. I am situationally aware. <laughs> cool. <laughs> now what? Yeah. So it sounds great. Just be more situationally aware. Yep. And that's just with the stuff you see. What about the guy coming up behind you? Some dude is like, you know, like spy versus spy. Mm -hmm. And I don't see him because, you know what, no matter what moms claim, no matter what teachers claim, nobody has eyes in the back of their head. Mm -hmm. And situationally aware is only the situation that you could perceive at the moment. Yep. You might see a guy with a gun and it tururns out he's actually actively engaging an active shooter. You have no idea. Like that might be the good guy, right? Th these are... It's a challenge. So, so it sounds great. It's a great. It's sort of a good piece of advice, but it's so incomplete as to be nearly useless when all anybody's like, "Well, you should have been more situationally aware." Yeah. So what? Even if I was, what am I going to do about? It? Do I recognize it's a danger, and what am I going to do about it if I do? To me, that sounds like something a lot of people say that aren't necessarily even doing it themselves. To be completely honest, that's like the cool thing to say, and then they're not. Like because it's not real. We just talked about that hypervigilance. It's not always real. It can't be. So, good. We have two Sean S's, but two different ones, and we'll get to that in a minute. Why do a lot of people believe that women should use for self-defense and home defense only a small caliber handgun, like a 22 LR, or maybe a 12-gauge shotgun, or the other end of the spectrum, a 12-gauge with magnum shells? Um, in my opinion, the minimum for anyone's defense in, uh, choice in self-protection is 30, 380 ACP, in, uh, and after that, it's just training and personal preference. I actually disagree. We were talking about this earlier. I think you can even leverage 22 LR and going up, and like 32 ball, 32 ball was considered the military and police cartridge in World War I. It, it's not like uh, people were smaller. It also killed... It, 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 it stacked bodies. Mm -hmm. so it still stacks it bodies. It still does. And so this is always one of those ones I find very dubious. It's like the minimum cartridge. Well, the minimum cartridge is dependent on lots of stuff. Yeah. And, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is the outlier, the outlier, the outlier, the outlier. Sure. Right. By the time we need to use a gun for self-defense or home defense, there's all sorts of other stuff that's going on. It's okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. We're... We'll just we'll just clap and go from there. Ready? Yeah. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Just... So by the time we're talking about guns, we're already talking about an outlier of an outlier of an outlier. So you know some of these details may or may not matter as much as we think we do. The other problem we've got out there is there's a lot of people out there who think they are experts or who have read something on the internet or watched a video on YouTube mm -hmm. and go, "Well, this is what I need. This is what we have to have." And they're not getting their information from great sources. Mm -hmm. And that's where you hear, well, just shoot a 12-gauge through the door. <laughs> what did you just shoot? Or we hear, girls can't handle recoil. Right. Or, you, you know, there's, there's a lot of stereotypes in here. There's a lot of, frankly, sexism in here. Absolutely. There's a lot of 
uh, can I say FUD lore? Yeah, you can say anything. There, there's a lot of FUD lore in here where people have ideas of what works and doesn't work that's not actually based on the research and the science and the real world experience of what we've seen out there. Mm -hmm. And the best that we can do is to advise people from our position and try to get people to listen to the people who actually have that education, experience, research, yeah. and everything else. That's where you get the, uh, I carry a 45 because they don't make a 46 nonsense, right? And really, 32 ball frequently will do the job. I'm not saying that's, yeah. I'm not, this is not a recommendation. That's the point. I'm saying that that doesn't mean it's, an in, it is sufficient in many circumstances. It may be insufficient in the outlier, but. And here's the thing, like, nuance is a thing. Thought, and we struggle with that as, we, pe as people. We want a rule. We want we want a magic tag. We want to say, if you buy this gun with this holster and you are able to shoot uh, a 90 or above on a 25 yard B8 and you can draw and fire to an A zone at seven yards in 1.3 seconds or less, you are set. And you're now safe from all threats in the world that could ever happen. You won't even have a car accident. Yeah. It's an it's an Here's ambulance. the rules. Here's the rules. Yeah. In reality, it's more like, well, if you meet certain minimum standards, and those minimum standards are, if you look at John Dobbs' work, mm -hmm. for most of us people who shoot guns, we'd be like, wow, that's really, really low. It is the minimum. It, it's like really <laughs> low. And are like, yeah, but we can prove people win gunfights with that. I'm like, fair point. Mm -hmm. I can't give you a rule that says if this is the gun that you have with you on the worst day of your life, this is what's going to win. I don't know. I can tell you how you can increase your odds. I can say, hey, but the odds of that happening are like this, and maybe you're more likely to bring this with you every day, and it's going to be enough for 90% of the outlier, outlier experiences as you're willing to have. Yeah. Are you, can, can you live with that trade-off because you have to live with this gun every day? Right, and if you're picking the wrong thing, you may not even have it with you because it's just too much of a pain in the ass. Yeah. You could also walk around with an M249 belt fed and lose. <laughs> it's possible. Or maybe, you know, that 22 is the thing that you've decided you could carry every day and, sorry, you just had a really bad day. Yeah. And it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Or hopefully a good day and you didn't need it at all. Nope. All right, the other Sean S, because the other Sean S apparently is an imposter and this is the real one. <laughs> so um, what has been, this is kind of similar, but uh, what has been your favorite credential drop or your opportunity to well actually something that you've made? Doesn't have to be gun culture related, like but stories of pink thirty eight special revolvers are funny as well. Like have you ever truth bombed something really good? You know, I did once and okay. it was amazing. Somebody wanted this is a little kind of obscure issue about drawing guns when the bad guy is rushing you from a short distance. And it's something I have a little bit of knowledge about. I've played with this a little bit. Yeah. And um, this came up in a video that somebody had Somebody has shared a video I had posted about like getting a gun from a poor position, some grappling video. And somebody's like, well, if they're rushing you, you're going to use a vertical elbow shield and blade your body away and draw your gun. Which is shiver work stuff. It's good stuff. But it's not. It's not? But it's not. What? You're not, you're not just going to elbow shield, but they're already practically on you. Okay. The, the right, arm's right. like the way. Fair enough. Fair right? enough. Yeah, fair. Okay. So he's like, but that's what you're going to do. And I'm like... I don't know, dude. I've been through a couple ECQCs. I am currently, right now, at the moment, in Cecil Birch's class as an AI. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's not how that's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, guy. Hey, dude. Like, I'm not saying I'm an expert at this, but I've got, like, here's my a little bit of my class resume and training resume. I've got a, at the time, I had a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Like, I think I know a thing or two about it. It's like, rrr, rrr, just because you took a class or two, and just because you, you know, drop a little bit doesn't mean you know. And I'm like, turns out that I had never taken a class from Of course, Greg. of course. I've never taken a Shivers class. Of course. Only knew about the vertical elbow shield from watching a couple of videos. All right. And had been like, well, yeah, of course that's how it's going to work. And he's like, well, I've done this with my training buddies. And we're like, for real? Like, you want to show up in class? He did an entire response video to me. There's like this 10 or 15 <laughs> minute video on the internet of like why Annette is wrong about how the vertical elbow shield works in the weapons based environment at mm. grappling distances. And like the first thing he does in that video is cross the muzzle yeah, over a body part. Of course, yeah. And the entire response thread in this group is like, you're wrong and she's right. And maybe you should listen to the person who's taken the classes, who is. 
doing, you know, who's, who's mm-hmm. showing mm-hmm. up enough that, yeah. like, you're not allowed on the student side of the table anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was a really... I kind of enjoy. That was my very first angry response. Oh, excellent. Yeah, everyone like, has, you're wrong. That's like, one of those moments in life when you're doing this kind of work. You finally get that when you're like, oh, oh. I made it. <laughs> like, oh, look, somebody made an angry response video. <laughs> and I was right. Yeah. <sighs> YouTube University is both a wonderful thing and a dangerous thing. Um, let's see here. Michael H., what is in your EDC? And is there anything specific that people should carry that isn't normally mentioned in, like, let's say, a more male-oriented discussion? Or is it really the same stuff? It's pretty much... I carry a, pretty much what the dudes carry. Mm. Prob- oh. Let me wind a little bit. I carry more than most people carry anyway. Okay, and fair. part of it is because this is what I do. Yes. Um, so, yes, I carry a gun. Uh, we all know why mm. I carry a gun. I carry a flashlight. Mm-hmm. So I like a really high candle a flashlight because I like using lights offensively. Lovely, you said candela, not lumens. There's a point there. Yes, I, I want, I want my light. You to want like, throw. I want throw, and I want really strong, almost violent throw. Mm-hmm. Because I want to be able to shine my light in somebody's face, and I want to get that like, oh, what are you doing? It can very truly be offensive. Yeah, yeah. I, I use light offensively, and there's arguments about whether or not you want that, but that's the choice that I use for it. I don't use it as an admin light mm-hmm. for the most part. Um, I carry a fixed blade knife. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that, we've talked about this a little bit, but I have a fair amount of grappling experience. I have a fair amount of grappling experience in the weapons-based environment. I know what I can do with a blade in terms of access and in fighting. And to me, it fills a niche that the gun is unable to fill because it's easier for me to get to the blade in the fight. Okay. I carry pepper spray. And I think these days it's become much more common to talk about pepper spray as part of the EDC. And to be popular about it, that is relatively new in the last couple of years. For everyone to be like, you should carry pepper spray. So maybe that's one of the lesser talked about things that everybody should carry. Um, I think women especially, there's a cool thing about pepper spray in my experience, is even when I bring pepper spray to places where maybe I'm, you know, there's a rule or something, what they tend to do is like, honey, you can't have that. I'm so sorry. And then they like, I go to concerts and they're like, they catch my pepper spray and they're like, you're going to have to check that. We'll give it back to you when you leave. Mm. It's a very friendly sort of thing. Versus finding a blade or a gun. Right. So if you get, if you get caught, it's not the, it's not the big deal. It's not a big, I mean, if they make you throw it out, it's like 10 or 15 bucks. It sucks, but it's not, it's not this traumatic. Oh, we found a pistol in there. But most of the time they apologize to you. I am so yeah. sorry. I have, I have to, to do this. this. I have to yeah. take this away from you. I'll give it back to you. Which is nice. Yeah. Like that's a kind of a cool thing. And you know, there's a lot of colleges that say you're not supposed to have pepper spray. And in reality, everybody knows that nobody actually cares if a girl's carrying pepper spray around. No. So. Yeah, it makes sense. That that's a really cool little trick that I've gotten, and it's a really useful tool that's going to solve most of your violent problems anyway. Yeah, mm, that's a good point. Jimbo J. Actually, this plays into the question before this last one. For someone who can't get to a ShivWorks class, what are ways to train at home or in other settings? So we're talking about someone that's kind of, maybe they just don't have the ability or the, the, the funds or where they live in a place that's remote. Like, what, what's, a good, what's a good thing to do? Uh, in the year of our lore, 2023, find a good jiu-jitsu gym. Okay. It does not matter if it is a sport-oriented gym or a self-defense-oriented gym. It doesn't matter really much about it as long as it's a decent school. And there's a lot of decent schools out there in the U.S. now, even in rural areas. That rural area might be, hey, there's like a purple or brown belt who comes down once or twice a week and teaches a class. Mm-hmm. But you'll probably be able to find that. Uh, if you can find wrestling, that's really cool too, or Muay Thai. But like jiu-jitsu, super, super accessible for most of us. Go train once or twice a week, four to six months. Call it a college semester of jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. And you will be so far ahead of most of the world when it comes to this combatives world. Yes. That, man, do they, that. They dovetail in really well. They dovetail together for so many reasons, not just the physical fighting, mm-hmm. but things that it teaches you about wanting to survive and wanting to win the fight. Just do that. So will. Yeah. It's also good for you. Yeah, it's great fitness. And um, you might make friends too. You probably make friends. Yeah. Well, that's great advice. So just do that. 
we can we can plug the weapons problem into that and figure out how that all fits together. Those are additions up and above, but that's though. That, but if you have that base skill level, man, you're going to be so far ahead. I saw that in my Shiv Works class when I took ECQC both times. It was the people that had any level of J jujitsu or BJJ were immediately dominating in the class, regardless of what weapon they had on them or not, or not even being armed. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter because they could control the situation. And they were they weren't scared by somebody getting in close to them. No, and that is scary. Like, when you're on the ground and there's two people on you where one of them's got their uh, their knee on your throat and you're starting to black out, it's kind of terrifying, quite honestly. It's less terrifying when it happens to you four times a week because that's how often you're training. But the first time it happens to you, and it's that's just, it's just in a class, you'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. But at least, even, even if you only went once and experienced that once, this is a weird thing to say, you're still better off than if you'd never had. And if it started happening in the street, you're like, well, I've experienced this before you're like it's a little you have a tiny slight edge that you wouldn't have had if you had it, right yep. i mean it doesn't mean you're there i'm not saying that but you at least have one step forward yeah every one of those is one step forward esri are there recommendations to best of the best way to vet instructors is there a good sniff test that can be applied <sighs> this is a source of much politics and infighting in the industry mm -hmm. so i have a couple of things that i look for one of them is I want instructors who understand that if I as the instructor screw up, my student will die. So I'm thinking about in the classroom on the ring on the mats, I'm thinking about when I send that student out to live their everyday life, and I'm thinking about that student when they meet that violent encounter. Mm -hmm. I have a responsibility to ensure that what I'm teaching them allows them to train safely, allows them to live safely, and allows them to do the very best they can do on that, on that worst day of their lives. If an instructor doesn't appreciate that gravity, then I don't know that they're the right person to be teaching you how to use things that can kill other people. Right? Like, yeah, guns are fun. I love shooting guns yeah, totally. for fun. You know, I'm going to go, we're going to go plink some steel plates. That's mm -hmm. awesome. But that gun used incorrectly could wind up with somebody dead absolutely and even the instructor who's out there saying hey we're gonna go have guns 101 we're gonna shoot some steel plates you're gonna have some fun they need to understand the gravity of putting that gun in your hands and teaching you how to use it mm -hmm. so that when you're back around it you don't accidentally hurt yourself hurt someone you love hurt the bystander mm -hmm. who is next to or behind the bad guy so that's the first thing I look for is do they understand the gravity of what they're doing? Does that inform everything they do? The other thing I look for is an instructor who's willing to put their work to the test. Okay. So the Shivworks Collective is a really great example. I, we keep this. mentioning that, but I, I agree with you. I've never seen anything that was more aligned with reality and productive training than Shivworks. I really haven't. So. They're, they're big ones. They're not the only ones. I'm not There's saying other, that. I'm just other, saying, yeah. this is but my this experience. Is this is the one I experienced. And yeah. they're an easy example because they're probably one of the most well-known ones mm -hmm. even in our niche world. Like, there's like, you can get really, really niche with others. Sure. But what they're willing to do is like, oh, I don't think that technique works. I think that I could vertical elbow shield blade and draw a gun while you're rushing me from three yards away. And then Craig's going to be like, well, let's have an evolution, right? right. And Craig's like, <laughs> all right, here's a Sims gun. Yep. Let's do it. Yep. Are they willing to put their techniques and their egos on the line to be like oh that let's see if it works or not and if they want to say hey there might be a couple of different ways to get here this is our way of doing it we think it works really well because x y and z but once they start veering into and there's no other way dogma a little bit more complicated okay. maybe, maybe a little bit less useful especially if you would tend to train with them as your only route yeah, maybe you could take something from that and then yeah. augment it with other training sure yep. And um, the third thing I look for is safety. Okay. So this is related Safety to... third. Always safety third. Remember that, though. Safety, <laughs> safety's always third. Hey, I'm a micro fan. Sa so... Safety's third. Yeah. I'm a micro fan, <laughs> so that might be true. So this really dovetails into the first one, right? Is, yeah. you know, are people going to... Do, are, do they understand the gravity of what we're doing? Yeah. But the safety piece of it is, like, some of that is the range safety or the physical training safety you know are they ensuring that people are acting in a way that you aren't likely to end up with a bullet in your back or in your arm yeah are they policing side? this environment are yeah policing the environment are they controlling these, these combative evolutions to be like hey this stuff is out of bounds 
that kind of thing. Here's a safe environment to do it in. And I've done ECQC evolutions in a gravel pit. I'm not saying you need, you know, like you need like these nice. There's some broken glass and razor blades. We're gonna roll in this. Yeah. So you, you know, like, are they controlling the environment to the extent that it, you're not gonna get yourself so hurt in training you can't defend yourself in real life? Yep. But also, are they creating a space where it is psychologically safe for you to train? Mm. Right. Like, I don't want to be in a class where I can't stick my hand up and be like, dude, that really makes me uncomfortable. That's a good point. Whether that's a physical safety thing like i am not comfortable with people, students handling guns behind the line mm -hmm. i should be able to raise my hand and be like hey uh dude over there has been like picking up his gun and playing with it i'm not cool with that is that an environment that i can do that but is it also an environment where i can be vulnerable like hey here's a thing that i'm really really scared about let's talk about it or here's this really awful experience i had that led me here and maybe that's not something you want to talk about in class that's cool but is it the kind of place where maybe that's okay you would want them to be open to such a thing, even if you don't necessarily decide to do it. Right. Or, or is it okay for me to be me? Like, can I go to this class and, like, be a girly girl, for instance? I've yeah. been in class with uh, people who are in transition and post-transition. Mm -hmm. And, like, how does that, how is that going to be? Like, do I get to be included? Mm -hmm. You know, do I get to be accepted? Do I get to be... Uh, part of the crew when it comes to everyone's making fun of everyone else right is it safe for me to be like that's awesome is it safe for me to be like yeah but not that part mm -hmm. is it safe for me to cry in that class i have cried in so many classes mm -hmm. i cried every single craig douglas class i have ever taken and that's a lot of them because mm -hmm. he does this thing at the end where we all talk about what we got out of the class and i'm like so <laughs> <laughs> But it's a safe place for me to do that. Like, yeah. the rea reaction to that should not be, what's that girl doing? I can't believe she's crying. Mm. Like, what a, what a baby. Mm. What a girl. Like, that shouldn't be what you have there. It should be like, so glad you shared that with us. Mm -hmm. You are such a badass for <laughs> doing this. Yep. You are so much better off today than you were two days ago with that fear. Like, that kind of support mm -hmm. is the other thing that I look for and like you know you take classes that are you know maybe a little bit more technique based and sure bit, and it's not going to get touchy feely mm -hmm. but you know I've taken like competition classes all we're there to do is like technical proficiency with your handgun get your splits down get, get your splits yeah and I'll get somewhere in the class and I'm just like bawling because I just can't do it and it's awful and everything is awful I'm gonna quit shooting mm-hmm it should be a good place to do that. Yep, it should be. You know, that's you know, it's funny because you talk about this about training environment, but this is something, and hopefully we're succeeding, and only the only the competitors can tell me. But that's what we try to nurture in the brutality events too, which is a different thing. Mm -hmm. But people are out there still practicing; they're still garnering skills, and um, we want this to be an environment where that's the case. If someone's, it's hard, and we have that group shared trauma of difficulty, <laughs> but we want everybody to be cheering each other on and like. If you par out, it doesn't matter. You did your best, right? The point is you're here, you're doing it, and everyone should be all included in that. And that's something we try to do here, too. And that's something I would say you'd also want to look for in any community you're part of, whether it's a comp competition community, a training community, or something else. If they're not accepting you, and more importantly, others, ah, it's probably something's off. And I'm not saying you're never going to run across that of stuff Of course, like that, of course, yeah. But what matters to me is the response. Like, I was in a class once, and where this dude, like, he was going way down the route, really objectifying women, saying mm. some really, really awful things. At least I thought they were awful. And in the beginning, I'm like, this is the way it is. And mm. like, some of it was kind of funny. Some of it was like, eh, whatever, but mm. I can let it ride. And I got to a point where I'm like, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. And I said something about it, and we got into a little bit of a spat. And the instructor, who is a figure in our community who a lot of us are rightfully afraid of because he's done some things, was just like, we're done. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't touchy feely. There wasn't like, mm -hmm. we didn't kumbaya or anything. But that moment, mm -hmm. like, hey, it is okay for me to be like, and there's a line and it got crossed. Yeah, yeah. This gets deep into the philosophical discussion of the tolerance of intolerance, but that's another conversation. But yeah, no, that makes sense. And this last question sort of also fits. This is from Utreon, which is another way to support in range as well, from FMJ. What sorts of challenges do you encounter in women's self-defense that don't necessarily exist for men, social, physical, or otherwise? You kind of touched on that a little bit already, right there. Yeah. But is like, is are there others that come to mind? 
Um, ultimately, we are the minority in this particular little niche of the world. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that comes with that. It can be really, really hard to be like the one who stands out in class. Yeah. Like it's as little as I'll show up in a class. I'm the only one who's not wearing black, brown, gray, or green. Mm -hmm. And I'll show up. I'm wearing like my purple shirt, and they're all mm -hmm. like, "Wow, she's different." <laughs> um, That's your nickname. Tiny purple demon. Yep. And you know, it, it can be a good thing. Like I've been adopted by a lot of really great crews who are like, "Here's our almost our mascot," right? <laughs> And there's good parts yeah. of that because, yeah. hey, I'm super, super welcome, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I enjoy being around these people, I, I enjoy, like, I get cool stuff, like, I just order a holster and, like, I have a perfect Kydex I have to make this for you in. Mm. That's really cool. Um, there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Sure. Because, like, who, who are you? You know, are you the girl? Are you, can you be respected for your ability to perform just, like... Are you good for a girl or are you just good? And which matters to you? Does it matter that you're good or not or that just that you're there? Mm -hmm. So, like, I think that's for everything that the majority thinks about, that the dudes think about when they show up, it's, like, us, but also, like, I'm doing this as a representative of, like, a representative of women sometimes. Yeah. No. Being the, being the, being the, the token. Being the, well, being the outsider or the minority in any environment, whatever that means. Like whether it's a woman in a class dominated by men or in many other things. It could be man, all sorts of things, right? Man in a class dominated by a woman. Yep. 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 Or, or any identity is difficult. And there's like a line between uh, one, they should be accepted to be part of the group. But there's a line of also tokenizing, and you can also cross that, and that's just as bad. Like, so would you just, just, I think, just acknowledge, in my opinion, acknowledge that that person's brave for being there and awesome, and that you just bring them in. Like, hug, come on in, you're one of us, right? And then you're no longer an outsider when you're one of us. Now you're one of us, right? You're one of us. Yeah. You are you individually. You are not you as a representative of all the people who are like you who are not here right now right yeah I, I think that that's a, a hard thing to do sometimes it because is. you're like you're trying to prove yourself you're trying to prove that like i'm not this or that or you're going the other direction where like but i want to be treated like i am mm -hmm. and like finding that middle ground and navigating that beyond just like my individual discomfort of being there but knowing that you know like if i decide that i'm going to be a range princess about the bathrooms i'm speaking for all the women out there because sometimes that's what it's like. And I, I get women mad at me about that, too. Yeah. You know, like, I get the guys mad at me because I'm being a princess about it. And I get the women mad at me because some of them would be like, well, I pee in the woods all the time. I don't see what your problem is. Oh, good for you. I'm like, that's cool. I, I just want to do just me. Like, I, I think there's a lot of women who'd like that. But, but it's, yeah, and it's, it's, it's cool if you're not. So, you know, how do you navigate all that? I don't know. A relatively, like, but that's an example of a fairly simple thing to open a door wider. Anything you can do to open that door a little wider, more people come in. And that's a good thing. And we need that in this in this community. All these communities. Every community could do a little bit better with, hey, like, come be a part of us. And in that regard, I'm so happy you're here and doing what you do. Thank you. And thank you for being on the channel and the stuff you've done previously with On Her Own within Range, but on your own as well. And hopefully we're going to do a lot more of that. we got this Q&A done right now. Yes. And we're going to have a whole bunch of cool gun nerd stuff coming up. We are going to be super, super nerdy, and I'm really looking forward to it. And so I just want to thank all of you out there that make it possible because, again, In Range is only supported by viewers like you. Patreon and Utreon, no advertisers, not sponsored, just you, the viewer. That's the only reason we're here and able to do conversations like this. And I'm thankful you're here, so appreciate it. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to doing more. Stay tuned for some more on her own and some more cool videos with Annette shortly.